can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Jason Kramer of Cultivize. And Jason, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out of the podcast before we get into it. And a uh, good friend, Jason Cement, who actually introduced us. There's two great episodes with him. He, um, Jason Cement and Elon Gold, uh, I did a, a joint interview with them. And you can ch- check out Jason's uh, website, at GetVisible.com. Elon Gold is one of my favorite comedians. And I was talking to Jason, telling him this. He's like, I'm actually friends with Elon. Do you want to have him on the podcast? I'm like, yeah, it was amazing, especially if you like impersonations. Uh, another one I did with Jason uh, and Carl Pontu and, and Bruce Lafetra. And we talk about task versus impact value. Um, and another one to check out, um, since this, we're going to talk deep in the agency world, is Jason Swank. Did two episodes with him where he talks about how he built up his eight-figure agency and sold it. And then what they're doing now uh, with their agency group. And he also has been acquiring agencies as well and how he values that. So check those out on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? Uh, we actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a business to launch and run their podcast. We do strategy, accountability, and all the execution around the podcast. And, you know, Jason, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that than to profile the people and companies I most admire and feature them and share what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. We're happy to help. And uh, with no, without further ado, Jason Kramer brings over 25 years of marketing technology experience to help B2B businesses and digital agencies streamline their sales and marketing process, retain more clients, improve repeat buyers, and enhance their internal external communications. He's going to give us some of the exact things he recommends and some of the big mistakes that people make with this. And he's one of the handful of certified CRM strategists and implementers in the world for the Sharp Spring platform, which um, by the time you're listening to this, may be rebranded into a different name. So just be on the lookout. Uh, but Sharp Spring is actually purchased by Constant Contact. And so look out for the rebrand name. And um, we'll talk about that later in the show. But his secret to success is his team's hands on approach and deep understanding of how to customize technology to reach business goals. And you can check out everything they're doing at cultivize.com. Jason, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Happy to be here. I'm really excited to hear about what you do because it's it's very interesting in this world, not only for someone to have a niche service, but have a niche service where they serve kind of a niche um, ecosystem, right? Um, but start off and just tell people a little bit about what you do at Cultivize. Sure, absolutely. So the, the secret here, and it really is no secret, um, is that Technology, as you and I both know, doesn't solve problems, right? So regardless if it's CRM technology or, or you know, project management t- technology, whatever it is. And so the secret sauce for us is, you know, all the experience I have as an entrepreneur coming in and looking at business processes, looking at the pain points, looking at the choke points, you know, in the process that a company has, or maybe they have no process at all. And then the most important thing is how do we build a strategy to pair up the right technology to meet those challenges and those goals. And I will tell you that even when you do that, you still have pitfalls because then you have to have the team at the client adopt that technology and adopt the process. So there's a lot of moving parts to it. And the success we have is really just being involved from the very beginning, as you mentioned, very hands-on. And we continue that hands-on approach for the lifetime of a client. And that's really where we're able to make a big impact. You make sure adoption occurs and then continues. Absolutely. So, I mean, accountability is huge. And so while we rely on the clients, you know, executive team and managers to keep their people under them accountable, we're also keeping everybody on the client side accountable as well with monthly strategy sessions and coaching sessions to make sure they're doing the things they're supposed to be doing and the goals are being hit that we've set. And then when you first 
And we'll get more detail in this, but I'm just curious. When you first engage with um, a client, mm-hmm. you're helping best structure their CRM? Yeah, exactly. So some companies we would talk to, mostly on the B2B side we deal with, uh, they don't have any technology in play that's for CRM sales tracking purposes. They're using spreadsheets or they're using some type of homegrown thing or people just taking notes you know, on a piece of paper. Um, so with those, we come in you know, and say, OK, can SharpSpring fit the need you know, for that team? Other organizations, because we deal again with B2B, they have proprietary tools, whether it's for the manufacturing industry they're in, the distribution industry, whatever it might be. And so we got to, you know, take the SharpStream platform and integrate it to that technology, to the ERP or whatever they're using, because we know they're not going to walk away from that technology. But we want to make sure that there's not duplicate data and duplicate data entry going into the process. Yeah, we mentioned niche service and niche technology that you work with. And there's a lot of CRMs out there. Yeah. So I'm, and I'm sure like you can plug and play your your, you know, um, playbook to any of these CRMs and it'd be successful. Why did you choose SharpSpring? Again, that's going to be rebranded. So I'm sure there's a different name when you're listening, but why SharpSpring? Why did you decide on SharpSpring? It's a great question. So, and I, and I, and I get asked that quite often. So we've been a partner of SharpSpring for about 15 years, almost since they've been in business. Um, and the reason we selected them after careful research for, for two main reasons, adoption is huge. And so when you look at platforms like a Salesforce, which is extremely complex and very powerful, it's not the easiest platform to people to adopt to start using. You know, HubSpot touts themselves, you know, for example, and not bad mouthing anything um, that they're simple to use. We get feedback that SharpString is much simpler than HubSpot. It's more intuitive. And so, you know, the adoption of a new piece of technology is super important. And if we can find a technology and a platform that's easier to use than something else, then that's to me a no brainer. The second piece is cost. You know, SharpSpring compared to let's say HubSpot is about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars less per year. Um, so again, a no brainer. You know, if you have a marketing budget and you're trying to grow the business, you know, and you can take that extra twenty, thirty thousand dollars and put it into something else that's gonna help the business grow, again. To me, no, no, you know, no brainer. So for the two reasons of cost and ease of use, those that would let us, you know, to the platform and it's all inclusive. So a lot of these CRM technologies out there and platforms are add on modules. Oh, you want that feature? You want this feature? It's another $50 a month. Or you want to add on more people? Okay, it's another $25 a month per user. You want to send out more emails? You want to upload more contacts? There's all these games that all these companies play. So your entry level price is relatively low. But once you start realizing all the potential of what you want to do with the platform, you realize it can, you know, pretty expensive. And so, you know, SharpStream doesn't have that model. Everything that they offer in terms of the platform is all included as soon as you open the box. I'm curious of the common migrations. Do you get people like, okay, Jason, we're on HubSpot. We want to move everything over. Yeah. Or is it mostly people just starting up from scratch? I'd say it's probably um, about 70% starting from scratch, 30% mm-hmm. moving over. Um, you know, we're working on an integration right now with uh, Salesforce. So a client uses Salesforce and Sales Loft. Um, and that's what they've been used to for the last you know decade or so or more. And so we're moving them off of those pieces of technology onto SharpSpring. Um, so yeah, that's something very common. And what's the most interesting thing I find, Jeremy, is that when they have technology, and usually they are committed to the technology for two reasons. One, because there's a loyalty of, oh, we've had it for 10 years. How can we get rid of it? Or, oh, we've spent, you know, a half a million dollars or whatever it is on this piece of technology over the last decade. I can't walk away from it. Like, there's so much money invested in it. And so when I get those things come up in conversation, my immediate response is, hey, let's jump on a Zoom call. I'd love to see how your sales team is using that technology on a daily basis. And guess what? Most companies can't show us that they're actually using the technology in a meaningful way. And so I let them then self-realize, well, we're not really using the technology to as much as we thought it was. It's sitting here and it's just sort of collecting dust and it's an expensive line item, you know, on the uh, the books every month, every year. And so by them looking at it from how they use it, that reveals a whole lot of, you know, opportunity. 
Yeah, I could see how it's painful because there's that sunk cost. And you look back out of all the people, they probably had consultants, they probably had people help yeah. set up at that time. And it's it's a painful thing to uh, probably rip off the Band-Aid. And they're, I don't know, are they, what other things are they worried about with the migration? Are they worried about lost data? Or what other things do people bring up as issues of why they wouldn't sure. migrate? It's not so much about lost data. Um, sometimes it's about getting data out. You know, if they have something that's really antiquated as a system, they might be concerned that they can't get the data out of that platform. So that's, you know, something even with Salesforce, as complicated as it is and sophisticated, the certain pieces of data you can't export out. And I will tell you, every platform is like that. I mean, even Sharpstring has certain pieces of information that can't be exported. Every piece, every CRM has that, you know, kind of loophole or whatever you want to call it. Um, but the secondary thing is the adoption. Oh, our team's so used to using this piece of technology for so many years. How long is it going to take them? And what's the trans, you know, uh, transition process going to be to get onto a new platform? And again, I go back to, okay, are they really using the technology that you have? And if we identify that they are, which a lot of companies are, and they're really doing things well with that piece of technology, we just do soft training. You know, okay, let's show you what Sharpspring can do. Let us show you the power. But what I find best in that situation, Jeremy, just to sum it up, before a decision is made to move off of one piece of technology over to, to us, we need the sales team to have a buy-in, right? So if leadership says, okay, we're doing this, and they never communicate with the sales team, the sales team sometimes, you know, is resentful and they're like, well, wait a second, like we're the ones using the technology. How come you didn't consult with us and let us be part of that decision process? So I always try to make a point to get at least the top tier salespeople involved in our early conversations and, and the demos and things like that. So they can see the power and they can see how much the easier things will be with Sharpspring or whatever the name will be, right? <laughs> At the point of this video. Um, but when we do that, then it makes it a lot easier of a transition process if we get them involved early on. Jason, are there other common um, places people migrate from? I could see spreadsheets. It seems like a no-brainer. Let's like yeah. professionalize this and actually get something that's more usable and friendly and, and send, can send things. Um, and then you mentioned the Salesforce with SalesLoft and HubSpot. Are there other common places that people are migrating from? Well, I mean, they're, they're pulling data from where they have it. I mean, we were, you know, we've worked with a client, several clients who just say, hey, like all my, I'm pulling all my contacts from LinkedIn and I'm going to put them into the CRM. And it's like, well, you've used LinkedIn for the last, you know, 10 plus years. Are those contacts even at the still the same company? And like, is the data even good, right? So, you know, they, they'll download information from Outlook, from their address book, from their Google contacts. And you, I mean, we've seen all crazy things, but, and that's fine. But the question is, how's the quality of data? So a big part of our process is cleaning that data through email hygiene cleaning and other tools we have to make sure the quality of the content um, that we're bringing in is, is valid and is usable, right? And it's not going to cause any problems down the road. You know, the last thing you want to do is import, you know, 10,000 contacts and you have, you know, a 30% bounce rate on your first email send because all your contacts in there, the most of them are just garbage, you know? It seems like an obvious acquisition from constant contact acquiring sharp spring because they have they've been in the email space for for decades yeah and now sharp spring brings that kind of management of the crm so it seems like a really good fit what were your thoughts were you worried at all um when constant contact purchased sharp spring and things would change or what were your thoughts at that point yeah, I mean, there was some certainly people that had, you know, concerns about that. You know, you go from a, I mean, Sharpstring was publicly traded, you know, so, I mean, they had about 150 or so employees when they got purchased. So they weren't a relatively, you know, small, small company. Um, but I thought it of a positive in the sense that here you have constant contact. They have a lot more procedures in place. They have more experience with building technology, with testing technology. And so... You know, they have a lot more resources, a lot more capital behind them. So to me, I saw it as a huge benefit in the sense that they're going to be able to make the platform of Sharpspring or whatever it's going to be called, right, as you're watching this video, um, a lot more, you know, robust, right? And they're going to, you know, give more power to it. They're going to, they're going to enhance the, what was already built. You know, it's like having like a car that's like a pretty decent car, but then you bring it to like the mechanic that works on Ferrari and then like, you know, that mechanic is going to soup up the car and make the car, you know, even better than it was. So, 
you know, that's the way I looked at it. You know, the only thing that I saw as a negative was like any transition, any acquisition of any company, there's going to be some pain points along the way, you know? Um, and so, you know, that was the only concerns I had, you know, and things were relatively smooth, you know, were there a few pain points, you know, uh, things here and there? Yeah, but that happens and it was expected, but everything's ironed out and, you know, and it was nothing major, you know, it was just, you know, training new support teams so that the constant contact support team understands the platform of SharpSpring. And that's going to take a little while for them to, you know, learn a new tool and learn yeah. how to help people with it. So, um, but overall. It kind of benefits you a bit, I, I imagine, if um, they constantly t- contact or learning it. Well, you already know it. So they could just, if someone's onboarding, you know, I don't know if they, do they refer people over to you who yeah, need more so- deeper, deeper help? Right. So SharpString is a company and even Constant Contact, to my knowledge, I mean, they're not really helping. Let's talk about SharpString for, for, for the purpose of this conversation. They don't help with, with onboarding in the sense of strategy planning and, and they don't even do demos anymore. So like if you're an agency and you sell SharpString, they don't even provide demos. Like you have to do the demo yourself, which is a problem if you're a smaller agency in the sense that you only have one or two clients on the platform you haven't really built things out, there's really nothing to demo, right? So how do you sell something if you can't show the value and what it's done for other clients? So we've been brought in both, you know, people finding us online, uh, as well as referrals from SharpSpring that say, hey, we got this agency, like they need help doing demos, they need help with onboarding, they need help with implementation, with coaching. And so, you know, we've been able to white label our service and we've worked with over, you know, 30 agencies at this point um, throughout the US and internationally to help their clients get more out of the SharpSpring platform. Yeah, so I want to talk about who you work with. And you mentioned one type of client, which is um, you will white label your service for an agency that may be serving their client. Their client wants to dig deep into the strategy and get their CRM in check. And then maybe that's not what they specialize in. They'll call you and white label your company. Yeah, so the the perfect fit for us really is working with an agency that's not a reseller of any CRM. In fact, they don't have the bandwidth and uh, maybe the desire to invest time and money and to bring on more people to their organization to sell SharpSpring, sell HubSpot, Salesforce, whatever it is. And so the way I look at it is they're leaving money on the table, right? Because any agency, regardless of how good they are, they're only, you know, half the equation, right? They're doing lead gen, they're getting leads into the organization, but then it's up to their client to actually talk to those leads, close the deal, close the loop, and then report back to the agency saying, yeah, you gave us 150 leads last month, we closed X percentage, this percentage weren't really qualified, and this is how much revenue we generated from those leads. Because if they're spending, you know, 10, 20 grand a month on inbound lead gen, you want to hope that they're going to be making, you know, 50, $100,000 as a profit on that on that turn of investment. And so the agencies, you know, from that we speak to that don't offer this struggle, right? And they struggle, Jeremy, because they ask the client the question, well, what happened to those 150 leads we gave you, right? And a lot of companies like, I don't know, right? Or like, yeah, they were good, they were okay, but they can't give definitive information to say, this is what actually was the best lead that we got and, and, and where it came from. And so what we see the vicious cycle is that the client will say, hey, agency, we've been working together a year. It's been great working with you, but we're just not seeing the results, right? We're moving on to another agency. And so you see this pattern a lot of times where every year or so, clients will switch agencies thinking that the next agency is going to have the next best answer. And the reality is it's not the agency's problem that's causing this. It's the client that doesn't have the system in place to track everything. So the upside, when we work with agencies and we say, hey, agency, we can do all the work. We can help with the strategy planning for integrating a CRM, integrating the technology they already have in play um, so that you can have transparency to see what's actually working. Is the Facebook campaign performing better than the AdWord campaign versus SEO? Is the trade shows you're helping them put together actually bringing in qualified leads that are actually turning into revenue? So it's not just digital. It could be print. It could be at a home. It could be radio, et cetera. We can track all of that. And so then the agency can say to the client, hey, client, you know, yeah, we generated leads, but now we can actually see that your sales team actually qualified, you know, 60% of those and we can see the revenue that you brought in. So, you know, and then the the third upside to all of this, right, Jeremy, and the most kind of exciting thing I think is that 
based on our model, we can give an additional passive revenue stream to the agency. So now the agency's bringing value to their client. It's making the client more sticky, right? Because there's a reason for the client to stay with the agency longer. And there's additional revenue coming into the agency for something that their team internally doesn't even have to touch. So, you know, we have an agency uh, in Manhattan, they're making a twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, you know, profit from us. And they're not doing anything other than just facilitating the relationship. You know, we're the ones that are doing all the work. So it's a huge, you know, potential um, opportunity. And, uh, you know, and, and for that specifically, we're looking for agencies that probably have clients spending north of, you know, five to 10 grand a month on inbound marketing. You know, if they're, if they're putting that level of investment, you know, they want to really have a system like we can provide to help protect that investment. So, Jason, would you say it's uh, an ideal agency that you'd white label this service for is a a lead generation agency that's in the B2B space? Yeah, I would say that it's a lead generation e-commerce. I mean, those transactions happen relatively quickly. So you, don't, you usually don't need a lead nurturing strategy. It's more about upsell and cross-sell and, and retargeting after they've made the purchase. Um, so, yeah, agencies that are working in B2B that have clients have a sales cycle, let's say of like three months to 12 months or longer, those are really good fits for us. Mm -hmm. you know, and higher ticketed sale purchase, you know, sales that are happening offline, not, you know, on the website. So walk me through how it would work. You mentioned, obviously, you know, the the company agency is serving their client deeper, there, there's passive revenue. How do you come in? So this agency says, Jason, we have a perfect client that we need you to help with? How does it work from the white label approach? Sure, so the first step is to start understanding who the client is, what are the pain points that they're seeing, um, understanding who the stakeholders are in, in the decision process, you know, that are involved in this issue that they're seeing, um, and then get introduced ultimately at some point to the client as, hey, Jason's, you know, our CRM kind of guru, you know, his team, you know, is, is part of, you know, not even his team, it's, it's our team we have now, right, right? because they don't know Cultivize. They don't even sometimes even know my last name, right? And so we start those conversations with the agency alongside of us. We're never talking to the client without the agency in the conversation. And we're starting to roadmap to say, okay, here's the problems we're identifying. And then once we identify those, we can show the value, then we'll come in and show what SharpSpring can do. We'll give examples of how SharpSpring has helped other B2B companies in a similar fashion solve those problems. So it's it's not just talking about it, but it's actually demonstrating that visually. And from there, you know, once it's sign off, our team handles the onboarding process, you know, road mapping out the build out. We do all the training, we do, you know, the fulfillment of everything. And so, you know, it's a pretty turnkey process. And because we've been doing it for so long, Jeremy, that process is really dialed in and we could get most clump companies up and running within 30 to 45 days, which is extremely rare when you're onboarding a new piece of CRM technology. Usually it's a three to six month process and you're spending all that money for six months and you can't even do anything, you know, with it until it's built. We can go really fast and in a very methodical way to get that done much quicker. I'm curious from a, a white label perspective, the communication part and the payment part. So the communication part, um, are they setting up the meetings and you're entering in? So it's under their, yeah. or, or do they still know that there's this division called cultivize how does it work from the communication part with the, yeah. with the client it's really up to the agency and it can even be up to each individual client so we've had some agencies where sometimes they'll say hey jason's with you know his own company cultivize we brought him in because they're the experts in the space and you know they're very transparent other agencies say you know jason's part of our team and so is heather and reed and all the people that work with jason and so when we talk to the client we're just part of the agency um We've gone as far as being given email addresses under the domain of those agencies. So that's something we can do. Um, and as far as payment goes, the agency is paying us. Um, so the client's paying the agency, agent pays us. And so, you know, as far as the client goes, er knows everything is going through the agency and just a service the agency offers. Yeah. And so when you're working with an agency, do you spec out, here's what it would be? on a monthly basis, and then they would decide to mark it up? Or do you have certain um, recommendations of what they should charge? Well, you know, so, 
Yeah, so the agencies that um, we white label are going to get a slight, uh, you know, discount of what you know retail pricing would be um, because we know that there is going to be a markup. But then there's also room in there to give them a commission back. So the two ways it typically works is that we'll give them um, if they're just referring us and they're like, we don't care about the white label. We just, you know, you can work directly with the client. and We see the value. Um, they'll get a 15 percent commission on everything we make. And that's in perpetuity. So as long as that client's with us for five years, you know, they're getting paid for five years. You know, even if they stop working with the client for any reason, they're still going to get paid from us. Um, and so the second option is that they want a white label. And that's where we would charge the agency. The agency charges the client. They get a discount on our pricing and then they market up to whatever they want. I mean, I've seen, you know, two, three hundred percent markups <laughs> and I've seen like, you know, more realistic, like 20 percent markups. So I think at the answer there is it's whatever the agency's clients is kind of like willing to pay. So if you got an, a client that's, you know, it's got a retainer of a half million dollars a month, you could probably do a considerable markup, you know, because they're not going to blink an eye. They're going to be like, all right, you know, it makes sense that, you know, the CRM is five grand a month, you know, and that might be a third of what we're charging the agency, you know. So I think it's really subject to the, the agency, the, how they bill and the types of clients they work with. The other type of client you have is uh, a B2B company, right? Yeah. Um, and maybe they don't have a great follow-up process. Um, talk about that type of B2B company uh, that you, you know, typically work with. Sure. So again, the factors for us to be successful and for the client to have success is that they have to be spending money on lead gen. That's number one. If they're getting their business through referrals and just, you know, networking, it's not really going to be a fit for us. Uh, they have to have a minimal, you know, sales team of a couple of people that's dedicated to selling. If it's the business owner and, you know, they're juggling in a bunch of things, you know, like I juggle and you juggle, right? Then, then that's not a fit, right? You need to have someone dedicated to selling. And then the third factor is you have to have buy-in. You have to have the company willing to say, yes, we see value in having a process, having a system, and we want to invest in that. You know, if, if someone is in, is, has a blind eye to that, then, you know, we, we just typically don't work with them. Um, but we work with clients in a, you know, mostly B2B, uh, which we talked about before. Um, a lot of those range in size. I'd say our clients average from about, you know, on the very small side, maybe three to five million dollars in revenue, and it could be north of a hundred million dollars in revenue in size. Um, and, and you know, employee count can change too. So we really don't look at those factors. We just look at, you know, are you spending money on marketing to drive leads? Is we don't do lead gen at all, right? We don't build websites. We don't do anything like that. Are you, you know, do you have a sales team, and and do you need a process? And if those three check boxes are there, then we can generally help. Let's walk through an actual example. Um, you worked with a company, Maslow Technologies. Uh, Maslow, yes. Ma yeah, what did you do there? So uh, Maslow had been using actually the SharpSpring platform for a little over a year um, with a very limited success. Um, and so what we were able to do is come in and really connect their um, sales process. So for them, for example, they're a small team of two salespeople, right? And they had a quoting system on their website, but people would just send an email and, and that's all happened. It's just the salesperson got an email. Um, now it goes into SharpSpring and opportunities created, the value of what that product they selected. They have lots of different products, goes into the opportunity. It, it tells the salesperson, are they you know, um, you know, ready to make a decision now? Or are they just looking for pricing? We also integrated a um, live chat feature on the website that's connected into SharpSpring. So if someone starts that chat, you know, it automatically feeds information in. And so now it's just a more refined process. Um, and the second phase to it is the quoting, right? So we talked to a lot of companies that will send out, you know, dozens of quotes in any given day and maybe even more than 100 a month. And when you're talking B2B, especially like manufacturing, that could be over like a million dollars worth of quotes out there, right? In, in potential revenue. And so many companies have no quote follow-up process because the sales team is just too busy or they just get distracted and they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to follow up with Jason next week. And then something happens, they forget to follow up with Jason. And so we can automate that process. We could have emails go out, you know, from the salesperson, from their name. And it looks like the email is a, you know, plain text email that, you know, Jason sent to John, but really it's the system sending it and say, hey, John, I sent you a quote 30 days ago. It's about to expire. You just want to make sure you're still interested. You know, if you'll get back to me today, I can extend it for another week. Right. And so 
whatever that is, and we modify for each client, we could try to bring in, you know, additional revenue, which we have, because now the system is just chasing that business that the sales team initiated. Let's talk about the quote follow-up process and some of the best practices and the biggest mistakes, because you probably go in and you see they have some process, maybe it's not a great process. What are some of the um, big mistakes you see uh, companies making when they're following up? Well, I think one is inconsistency in in the follow up process, right? So they, you know, they do it when they remember to do it, or they're a little bit slow in one day, and they're like, "Oh, I'm going to reach out to these people," you know, and they do it with no rhyme or reason. Um, so, so that's one, right? There, there's no there's no process there. The second is sometimes they're too aggressive. You know, they reach out every couple of days, or they're you know making phone calls or sending emails, and then it turns people off, right? So you want to do it in in a way that's you know ethical, but also in a way that's friendly and just not overbearing and, and too aggressive. Um, and then the other piece of it is, is that you need to be able to have reporting and tracking. So if you know you sent out, you know, 50 quotes, how many of those are likely to close? How many of those did you follow up with? Which ones do you need to still follow up with? And so if you don't have a system, how are you going to keep track of all this activity you're doing? And at the end of the day, you know, we both of us know a lot of salespeople, right? What do salespeople want to do? They want to sell. <laughs> That's really what they want to do. They don't want to be stuck with the mundane follow-ups, the emails, right? And, and they're, if they're not good at writing then and wordsmithing, then the emails that they send out are going to be kind of terrible. You know, they're not going to show value of why they're reaching out. So if we can create those templates and create a, a system and a process, it just gives more power to the sales team to be more effective and allows them to spend their time actually selling versus just doing all these other tasks that we could take off their plate. So, you know, what are some of the best practices? So in the actual message that you're sending out yeah. to follow up, um, again, I'm sure it all varies, but you don't want people to be too aggressive, but, you know, it, what's that sweet spot of actually keeping in touch, but not being too aggressive. And also you mentioned showing value when reaching out. So talk a little bit more about what should you put in the in an email? So it's not always like, hey, we sent you this quote. Hey, we sent you this quote, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. What are some of the other things that you recommend people putting in as, as a follow-up? Well, so I'll talk about Cultivize, for example. So, you know, for us, you know, to get a client really going and, and moving full steam, it could be a few months, right, for the sales team to really get in the groove. So what we tell people is, okay, well, if you're looking to make a decision about working with us, keep in mind that whenever you make that decision, things aren't really going to start jiving for probably about three months, right? So if if you say, hey, Jason, I really, you know, summer is a really busy season. We, we need to get this locked down before the summer starts. Well, if it's going to take three months to ramp up, we need to have everything wrapped up, you know, before summer hits, which means we need to backtrack three months from now, you know, where we're, you know, from that date. So timing is really important to, you know, yeah, especially in, let's say, the manufacturing space. It could take three months to build a piece of equipment. So it's like, hey, if you need that piece of equipment for farming, for agriculture, you know, then what well, we need to know in advance, you need that so we can build it for you. You can't tell us a week before that you need it, right? Because it's not going to be ready. So I think that understanding your client, understanding their needs and, and what's going to make them pivot um, to make a decision. I believe in education is another big factor, too. So rather than just saying, hey, you know, when are you going to make a decision, the content we typically would send and a lot of our clients send is educating the consumer about what it is that they're looking at. So I'll send people articles from, you know, Forbes, how to pick a CRM, what to avoid when looking at a CRM, what questions to ask, uh, you know, information about what makes your MailChimp account different than a CRM, you know, why those two different things, you know, why they're not the same. So sending information about you know, and educating them, I think brings value because you're not trying to sell. You're just saying, okay, whether or not you work with us or not, we want to make sure that you have the most, inf- you know, up-to-date information and are informed when you do make that final decision. Yeah. So it sounds like the two biggest things is really understanding their goals. They may have a certain time that they want to get this out the door. And, you know, so there you can, you're basically following up on their, on their goals based on the timeline. Yeah. And the second is just adding value and education. So allowing them to, you know, they're thinking of making a switch sometimes and allowing them to make the best decision. Yeah. Because listen, you want to, it's a big decision they're going to make, you know, and a lot of these 
piece of technology, specifically talking about CRM, sometimes you're signing up for an annual contract. And if you make that wrong decision, it could be a really expensive mistake. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is you had an agency before um, yeah. that you sold. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of wanted to go back to, not, you know, you're from the New York area. 9-11. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, where were you when 9-11 hit and what were you doing? So I was working at an agency uh, in uh, Union Square. Um, it came out of the, I was living in uh, Greenpoint, Brooklyn at the time. So I come out of the subway and uh, like everybody, you, know, you look down at downtown, which had a clear view from there and uh, saw of smoke at the towers and think something's happening, but you don't really know what's happening. And uh, yeah, and, when, and short story is, you know, went up to the office and everybody's in the conference room and people are still trying to gather what's happening. And at that point, you know, the second plane hadn't hit yet. And, um, you know, then you start flashing over and seeing things happening in D.C. and, and in Pennsylvania. And um, and I knew that, you know, something was not right, of course. You know, the, the, it's just, you know, it just it seemed like what, what's going on here. And uh, as soon as the I think as soon as I pull all that together and the second plane hit, I pretty much just like I'm, I'm out of Manhattan. Like this just this is not a good sign right now. And so I remember everything was shut down, like payphones weren't working, subways were shut down, and I wound up walking um, all the way down to the Williamsburg Bridge, over the Williamsburg Bridge, back to Brooklyn, which I don't even know how many hours that took. I don't remember, but I do remember everybody that was downtown coming up, you know, before the, even the buildings had fallen that, you know, were still covered in soot. So, you know, walking across the bridge and seeing everybody just you know, cars, police cars, ambulances, and people just, you know, gray all over their clothing, you know, right, and soot. And so it's a pretty startling, you know, thing to see for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll never forget, you know, that experience and trying to process all of that, you know. And this is, you know, again, when I'm, you know, in my early 20s. So it's like, there's not a whole lot of life experience you have to even witness other things like that. So you're trying to process everything and make, make heads and tails of it. Did that cause you to, change course in your career? It did. Um, it wasn't from the specific event. So the agency I worked at, we had Virgin Atlantic um, Airways was an account I worked on and other travel clients, other global clients. And the agency went from about 60 something people down to about 14 people um, in a very short time frame. And I was one of the 14 left. And I was already doing a lot of freelance work on the side as a graphic designer. I've gone to Syracuse for communication design. And I said, well, you know, I could go work for another agency or let me just see if I could turn this freelance business into a full-time gig. And so that's what I did. I, I decided to hang that shingle um, and get some, you know, space in the city with other people that had left the agency that were starting their own business in, in video production. And, and that's how it started. And then, you know, it started as graphic design and then people were like, hey, can you build websites? And we started building websites and we got, you know, really good at that. And then web development became a big piece of the business. Um, but yeah, it was, it was because of that. I mean, if the agency stayed stable, I probably would have stayed at the agency for, for a bit longer and who knows, maybe for forever and gone to another agency. So it was definitely a, a catalyst to the decision-making process. So with, um, JLK creative, which is your previous agency founded in, in 2002, yeah. um, at what point did you decide, um, you know, I'm going to, to sell? Well, I think it was a few things. One, I was really just getting burnt out of building websites and, and doing the design side of projects um, for so many years. Um, I was just looking for a change. And I always think that, and I, and I know that my left brain and right brain kind of work, you know, very closely together. So I'm a very process oriented person. I, you know, and, you know, had been using working with SharpSpring for, um, at that point, I'm trying to do the math, but it was, it was probably about 2000 and, uh 15 or so that we started working with SharpSpring. So, you know, even years before I sold the business, we're already working with the technology. And, uh, you know, plus you also had all these competitors, you know, had 99designs, you had Upwork, you had all these things coming up. So even though that wasn't our clientele, you know, you tell a client, oh, it's going to be five, 10 grand to design a logo. And they're like, well, I can get one to $200. I don't understand why I'm paying you 10 grand. Then you start have to, understand, you know, talk to people about, you know, well, that's not really the same thing. You know, it's not apples to apples. And so, because of just, you know, the changes and then the more flexibility people had to get a website built for free by GoDaddy, you know, some businesses didn't see the value in, in what we brought to the table. And it became harder and harder 
to to battle yet another objective, you know, or objection rather, you know, in the sales process. So um, fortunately, I had a really great you know business partner on the web development side. She took over all the web you know clients, um, and then you know sold that off, and then the design stuff sort of just fizzled out. Yeah. I have one last question, sure, uh, Jason, and thank you. Thanks for sharing your journey yeah, and uh, your advice on this. And I just want to encourage people to check out uh, cultivize.com to learn more about what you're doing uh, there. And if they want to get in touch with you, they can go uh, to cultivize.com and go to the contact page. Um, Jason, you know, throughout this journey, you've been in the agency space for for decades now. Who are some of the mentors? It could be personal mentors or distant mentors, just someone you learn from, from courses or resources um, that you kind of look back on that helped you on this journey? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I think the one thing that for sure, um, to sum that up, I started the business as a sculptor, right? I was a graphic designer. And I said, okay, I want to build a business around graphic design services. And so I didn't know anything about running a business. You know, I, I had a car detailing business, you know, in, in high school through college, you know, and probably didn't even make money, but I just enjoyed doing it. Right. And, you know, it didn't charge enough, you know, cover costs. So you, you learn as you go, but um, I had worked with uh, people like Ed Abel, uh, Matt Perlman, um, uh, Larry Sharp, who actually is uh, now in, in, in politics and, and um, you know, running for uh, different uh, positions there who were all different types of mentors and sales trainers and business coaches along the way. And those three people, you know, the most, made the impact to understand, okay, this is how you run a business. This is how you build profit. This is how you build processes. This is how you, you know, do all the things you need to do to be successful. And so, you know, it took me to be honest, you know, a few years. I mean, the one thing I could offer for anybody listening that's young in business starting out is like bring in other people that have done this before and helped other people as early as possible. Because that once I started doing that and bringing these other people into my world, things just escalated much quicker, you know, because you 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 learn what would take you years to learn on your own. You learn within, you know, a few months of working with these people. Love it. Jason, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out cultivize.com and more episodes of the podcast. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone. Right, thank you. This has been great. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. Like a peach if you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand